Percival Bland's Proxy in the Missing Mortgagee, R. Austin Freeman, Part 1, Percival Bland's Proxy, Chapter 1 An Uncommon Criminal, Mr. Percival Bland was a somewhat uncommon type of criminal. In the first place he really had an appreciable amount of common sense. If he had only had a little more, he would not have been a criminal at all. As it was, he had just sufficient judgment to perceive that the consequences of unlawful acts accumulate as the acts are repeated, to realize that the criminal's position must, at length, become untenable, and to take what he considered fair precautions against the inevitable catastrophe, but in spite of these estimable traits of character and the precautions aforesaid, Mr. Bland found himself in rather a tight place and with a prospect of increasing tightness. The causes of this uncomfortable tension do not concern us, and may be dismissed with the remark, that, if one perseveringly distributes flash bank of England notes among the money changers of the continent, there will come a day of reckoning when those notes are tendered to the exceedingly knowing old lady who lives in Threadneedle Street. Mr. Bland considered uneasily the approaching storm cloud as he raked over the miscellaneous property in the sale rooms of Messrs. Plimpton. He was a confirmed frequenter of auctions, as was not unnatural, for the criminal is essentially a gambler. And criminal and gambler have one quality in common, each hopes to get something of value without paying the market price for it, so Percival turned over the dusty oddments and his own difficulties at one and the same time. The vital questions were, when would the storm burst? And would it pass by the harbour of refuge that he bad been at such pains to construct? Let us inspect that harbour of refuge a quiet flat in the pleasant neighbourhood of Battersea bore a nameplate inscribed, Mr. Robert Lindsay, and the tenant was known to the porter and the charwoman who attended to the flat, as a fair-haired gentleman who was engaged in the book trade as a travelling agent, and was consequently a good deal away from home. Now Mr. Robert Lindsay bore a distinct resemblance to Percival Bland, which was not surprising seeing that they were first cousins, or, at any rate, they said they were, and we may presume that they knew. But they were not very much alike. Mr. Lindsay had flaxen, or rather sandy, hair, Mr. Bland's hair was black. Mr. Bland had a mole under his left eye, Mr. Lindsay had no mole under his eye but carried one in a small box in his waistcoat pocket. At somewhat rare intervals the cousins called on one another, but they had the very worst of luck, for neither of them ever seemed to find the other at home. And what was even more odd was that whenever Mr. Bland spent an evening at home in his lodgings over the oil shop in Bloomsbury, Mr. Lindsay's flat was empty and as sure as Mr. Lindsay was at home in his flat so surely were Mr. Bland's lodgings vacant for the time being. It was a queer coincidence, if anyone had noticed it, but nobody ever did, however, if Percival saw little of his cousin, it was not a case of out of sight, out of mind. On the contrary, so great was his solicitude for the latter's welfare that he not only had made a will constituting him his executor and sole legatee, but he had actually insured his life for no less a sum than three thousand pounds, and this will, together with the insurance policy investment securities and other necessary documents, he had placed in the custody of a highly respectable solicitor, all of which did him great credit. It isn't every man who is willing to take so much trouble for a mere cousin, Mr. Bland continued his perambulations, poring over the miscellaneous raffle from sheer force of habit, reflecting on the coming crisis in his own affairs, and on the provisions that he had made for his cousin Robert. As for the latter, they were excellent as far as they went, but they lacked definiteness and perfect completeness. There was the contingency of a stretch, for instance, say fourteen years penal servitude. The insurance policy did not cover that. And, meanwhile, what was to become of the estimable Robert? He had bruised his thumb somewhat severely in a screw-cutting lathe, and had abstractedly turned the handle of a bird organ until politely requested by an attendant to desist, when he came upon a series of boxes containing, according to the catalogue, a collection of Sir Jekyll instruments the property of a lately deceased practitioner to judge by the appearance of the instruments, the practitioner must have commenced practice in his early youth and died at a very advanced age. They were an uncouth set of tools, of no value whatever excepting as testimonials to the amazing tenacity of life of our ancestors, but Percival fingered them over according to his wont, working the handle of a complicated brass syringe and ejecting a drop of greenish fluid onto the shirt of a dressy Hebrew, who requested him to point the damn thing at them ear knelt next time, opening musty leather cases clicking off spring scarifiers and feeling the edges of strange, crooked, knives. Then he came upon a largish black box, which, when he raised the lid, breathed out an ancient and fish-like aroma and exhibited a collection of bones, yellow, greasy and spotted in places with mildew. The catalogue described them as a complete set of human osteology but they were not an ordinary student's set, for the bones of the hands and feet, instead of being strung together on catgut, 
were united by their original ligaments and were of an unsavory brown color, I tha, mistha, expostulate the Hebrew, shut that box. Melt like a blooming inquist. But the contents of the black box seemed to have a fascination for Percival. He looked in at those greasy remnants of mortality, at the brown and moldy hands and feet in the skull that peeped forth eerily from the folds of a flannel wrapping, and they breathed out something more than that stale and musty odor. A suggestion vague and general at first, but rapidly crystallizing into distinct shape seemed to steal out of the black box into his consciousness, a suggestion that somehow seemed to connect itself with his estimable cousin Robert, for upwards of a minute he stood motionless, as one immersed in reverie, the lid poised in his hand and a dreamy eye fixed on the half-skull. A stir in the room roused him. The sale was about to begin. The members of the knockout and other habitués seated themselves on benches around a long, baize table. The attendants took possession of the first lots and opened their catalogues as if about to sing an introductory chorus, and a gentleman with a waxed moustache and a striking resemblance to his late majesty, the third Napoleon, having ascended to the rostrum bespoke the attention of the assembly by a premonitory tap with his hammer, how odd are some of the effects of a guilty conscience. With what absurd self-consciousness do we read into the minds of others our own undeclared intentions, when those intentions are unlawful? Had Percival Bland wanted a set of human bones for any legitimate purpose such as anatomical study he would have bought it openly and unembarrassed. Now, he found himself earnestly debating whether he should not bid for some of the surgical instruments, just for the sake of appearances, and there being little time in which to make up his mind for the deceased practitioner's effects came first in the catalogue he was already the richer by a set of cupping glasses, a tooth key, and an instrument of unknown use and diabolical aspect, before the faithful lot was called. At length the black box was laid on the table, an object of obscene mirth to the knockers out, and the auctioneer read the entry, Lot 17, a complete set of human osteology. A very useful and valuable set of specimens, gentlemen. He looked round at the assembly majestically, oblivious of sundry inquiries as to the identity of the deceased and the verdict of the coroner's jury, and finally suggested five shillings, six, said Percival. An attendant held the box open, and, chanting the mystic word Lodelman, which, being interpreted, meant lot, gentlemen, thrust it under the rather bulbous nose of the smart Hebrew, who remarked that they ummed a bit too much to toot him and pushed it away, going at six shillings, said the auctioneer, reproachfully, and as nobody contradicted him, he smote the rostrum with his hammer and the box was delivered into the hands of Percival and payment of that modest sum. Having crammed the cupping glasses, the tooth key and the unknown instrument into the box, Percival obtained from one of the attendants a length of cord, with which he secured the lid. Then he carried his treasure out into the street, and, chartering a four-wheeler, directed the driver to proceed to Charing Cross Station. At the station he booked the box in the cloak, in the name of Simpson, and left it for a couple of hours, at the expiration of which he returned, and, employing a different porter's had it conveyed to a hansom, in which it was borne to his lodgings over the oil shop in Bloomsbury. There he, himself, carried it, unobserved, up the stairs and, depositing it in a large cupboard, locked the door and pocketed the key, and thus was the curtain rung down on the first act. The second act opened only a couple of days later. The office of cool boy to pursue the metaphor to the bitter end being discharged by a Belgian police official who emerged from the main entrance to the Bank of England. What should have led Percival Bland into so unsafe a neighborhood it is difficult to imagine, unless it was that strange fascination that seems so frequently to lure criminal to places associated with his crime. But there he was within a dozen paces of the entrance when the officer came forth, and mutual recognition was instant. Almost equally instantaneous was the self-possessed Percival's decision to cross the road. It is not a nice road to cross. The old horse would condescend to shout a warning to the indiscreet wayfarer. Not so the modern chauffeur, who looks stonily before him and leaves you to get out of the way of juggernaut. He knows his exonerating coroner's jury. At the moment, however, the procession of juggernauts was at rest. But Percival had seen the presiding policeman turn to move away and he darted across the fronts of the vehicles even as they started. The foreign officer followed. But in that moment the whole procession had got in motion. A motor omnibus thundered past in front of him, another was bearing down on him relentlessly. He hesitated, and sprang back, and then a taxi cab, darting out from behind, butted him heavily, sending him sprawling in the road, whence he scrambled as best he could back onto the pavement. Percival, meanwhile, had swung himself lightly onto the footboard of the first omnibus just as it was gathering speed. A few seconds saw him safely across at the mansion house, and in a few more, he was whirling down Queen Victoria Street. The danger was practically over, 
though he took the precaution to alight at St. Paul's, and, crossing to Newgate Street, board another westbound omnibus, that night he sat in his lodgings turning over his late experience. It had been a narrow shave. That sort of thing mustn't happen again. In fact, seeing that the law was undoubtedly about to be set in motion, it was high time that certain little plans of his should be set in motion, too. Only, there was a difficulty, a serious difficulty. And as Percival thought round and round that difficulty his brows wrinkled and he hummed a soft refrain, then is the time for disappearing. Take a header down you go, a tap at the door cut his song short. It was his landlady, Mrs. Brattle, a civil woman, and particularly civil just now. For she had a little request to make. It was about Christmas night, Mr. Bland, said Mrs. Brattle. My husband and me thought of spending the evening with his brother at Hornsey, and we were going to let the maid go home to her mother's for the night, if it wouldn't put you out, wouldn't put me out in the least, Mrs. Brattle, said Percival, you needn't sit up for us, you see, pursued Mrs. Brattle, if you just leave the side door unbolted. We shan't be home before two or three, but we'll come in quiet not to disturb you, you won't disturb me, Percival replied with a genial laugh. I'm a sober man in general but Christmas comes but once a year. When once I'm tucked up in bed, I shall take a bit of waking on Christmas night, Mrs. Brattle smiled indulgently. And you won't feel lonely, all alone in the house, lonely! exclaimed Percival. Lonely! With a roaring fire, a jolly book, a box of good cigars and a bottle of sound port ah, and a second bottle if need be. Not I, Mrs. Brattle shook her head. Ah, said she, you bachelors! Well, well! It's a good thing to be independent! and with this profound reflection she smiled herself out of the room and descended the stairs, as her footsteps died away Percival sprang from his chair and began excitedly to pace the room. His eyes sparkled and his face was wreathed with smiles. Presently he halted before the fireplace and, gazing into the embers, laughed aloud, damn funny! said he. Deuced rich! Neat! Very neat! Ha! Ha! And here he resumed his interrupted song, when the sky above is clearing, when the sky above is clearing, bob up serenely, bob up serenely, bob up serenely from below, which may be regarded as closing the first scene, of the second act, during the few days that intervened before Christmas Percival went abroad but little, and yet he was a busy man. He did a little surreptitious shopping, venturing out as far as Charing Cross Road, and his purchases were decidedly miscellaneous. A porridge saucepan, a second-hand copy of Grey's Anatomy, a rabbit skin, a large supply of glue and upwards of ten pounds of shin of beef seems a rather odd assortment, and it was a mercy that the weather was frosty, for otherwise Percival's bedroom, in which these delicacies were deposited under lock and key, would have yielded odorous traces of its wealth. But it was in the long evenings that his industry was most conspicuous, and then it was that the big cupboard with the excellent lever lock, which he himself had fixed on, began to fill up with the fruits of his labours. In those evenings the porridge saucepan would simmer on the hob with a rich lading of good scotch glue, the black box of the deceased practitioner would be hauled forth from its hiding place, and the well-thumbed grey laid open on the table, it was an arduous business though, a stiffer task than he had bargained for. The right and left bones were so confoundedly alike, and the bones that joined were so difficult to fit together. However, the plates in grey were large and very clear, so it was only a question of taking enough trouble. His method of work was simple and practical. Having fished a bone out of the box, he would compare it with the illustrations in the book until he had identified it beyond all doubt, when he would tie on it a paper label with its name and side right or left. Then he would search for the adjoining bone, and, having fitted the two together, would secure them with a good daub of glue and lay them in the fender to dry. It was a crude and horrible method of articulation that would have made a museum curator shudder. But it seemed to answer Percival's purpose whatever that may have been for gradually the loose items came together into recognizable members such as arms and legs, the vertebra which were, fortunately, strung in their order on a thick cord were joined up into a solid backbone, and even the ribs, which were the toughest job of all, fixed on in some semblance of a thorax. It was a wretched performance. The bones were plastered with gouts of glue and yet would have broken apart at a touch. But, as we have said, Percival seemed satisfied and as he was the only person concerned, there was no more to be said, in due course, Christmas Day arrived. Percival dined with the Brattles at two, dozed after dinner, woke up for tea, and then, as Mrs. Brattle, in purple and fine raiment, came in to remove the tea tray, he spread out on the table the materials for the night's carouse. A quarter of an hour later, the side slammed, and, peering out of the window, 
he saw the shopkeeper and his wife hurrying away up the gaslit street towards the nearest omnibus route. Then Mr. Percival Bland began his evening's entertainment, and a most remarkable entertainment it was, even for a solitary bachelor, left alone in a house on Christmas night. First, he took off his clothing and dressed himself in a fresh suit. Then, from the cupboard he brought forth the reconstituted set of osteology and, laying the various members on the table, returned to the bedroom, whence he presently reappeared with a large, savoury parcel which he had disinterred from a trunk. The parcel being opened revealed his accumulated purchases in the matter of shin of beef, with a large knife, providently sharpened beforehand, he cut the beef into large, thin slices which he proceeded to wrap around the various bones that formed the complete set, whereby their nakedness was certainly mitigated though their attractiveness was by no means increased. Having thus clothed the dry bones, he gathered up the scraps of offal that were left, to be placed presently inside the trunk. It was an extraordinary proceeding but the next was more extraordinary still, taking up the newly clothed members one by one. He began very carefully to insinuate them into the garments that he had recently shed. It was a ticklish business, for the glue joints were as brittle as glass. Very cautiously the legs were separately inducted, first into underclothing and then into trousers, the skeleton feet were fitted with the cast toff socks and delicately persuaded into the boots. The arms, in like manner, were gingerly pressed into their various sleeves and through the armholes of the waistcoat, and then came the most difficult task of all to fit the garments on the trunk. For the skull and ribs, secured to the backbone with mere spots of glue, were ready to drop off at a shake, and yet the garments had to be drawn over them with the arms enclosed in the sleeves. But Percival managed it at last by resting his restoration in the big, padded armchair and easing the garments on inch by inch, it now remained only to give the finishing touch which was done by cutting the rabbit's skin to the requisite shape and affixing it to the skull with a thin coat of stiff glue, and when the skull had thus been finished with a sort of crude, makeshift wig, its appearance was so appalling as even to disturb the nerves of the matter-of-fact Percival. However, this was no occasion for cherishing sentiment. A skull in an extemporized wig or false scalp might be, and in fact was, a highly unpleasant object, but so was a Belgian police officer. Having finished the restoration, Percival fetched the water jug from his bedroom, and, descending to the shop, the door of which had been left unlocked, tried the taps of the various drums and barrels until he came to the one which contained methylated spirit, and from this he filled his jug and returned to the bedroom. Pouring the spirit out into the basin, he tucked a towel round his neck and filling his sponge with spirit proceeded very vigorously to wash his hair and eyebrows, and as, by degrees, the spirit in the basin grew dark and turbid, so did his hair and eyebrows grow lighter in color until, after a final energetic rub with a towel, they had acquired a golden or sandy hue indistinguishable from that of the hair of his cousin Robert. Even the mole under his eye was susceptible to the changing conditions, for when he had wetted it thoroughly with spirit, he was able, with the blade of a penknife to peel it off as neatly as if it had been stuck on with spirit gum. Having done which, he deposited it in a tiny box which he carried in his waistcoat pocket. The proceedings which followed were unmistakable as to their object. First he carried the basin of spirit through into the sitting room and deliberately poured its contents onto the floor by the armchair. Then, having returned the basin to the bedroom, he again went down to the shop, where he selected a couple of galvanized buckets from the stock, filled them with paraffin oil from one of the great drums and carried them upstairs. The oil from one bucket he poured over the armchair and its repulsive occupant, the other bucket he simply emptied on the carpet, and then went down to the shop for a fresh supply. When this proceeding had been repeated once or twice the entire floor and all the furniture were saturated, and such a reek of paraffin filled the air of the room that Percival thought it wise to turn out the gas. Returning to the shop, B poured a bucket full of oil over the stack of bundles of firewood, another over the counter and floor and a third over the loose articles on the walls and hanging from the ceiling. Looking up at the latter B now perceived a number of greasy patches where the oil had soaked through from the floor above, and some of these were beginning to drip onto the shop floor he now made his final preparations. Taking a bundle of wheel fire lighters, he made a small pile against the stack of firewood. In the midst of the fire lighters he placed a ball of string saturated in paraffin, and in the central hole of the ball he stuck a half dozen diminutive Christmas candles. This mine was now ready. Providing himself with a stock of fire lighters, a few balls of paraffin string and a dozen or so of the little candles, he went upstairs to the sitting room, which was immediately above the shop. Here, by the glow of the fire, he built up one or two piles of fire lighters around and partly under the armchair, placed the balls of string on the piles and stuck two or three bundles in each ball. Everything was now ready. 
stepping into the bedroom. He took from the cupboard a spare overcoat, a new hat and a new umbrella for he must leave his old hats, coat and umbrella in the hall. He put on the coat and hat, and, with the umbrella in his hand, returned to the sitting room. Opposite the armchair he stood a while, irresolute, and a pang of horror shot through him. It was a terrible thing that he was going to do, a thing the consequences of which no one could foresee. He glanced furtively at the awful shape that sat huddled in the chair, its horrible head all awry and its rigid limbs sprawling in hideous grotesque deformity. It was but a dummy, a mere scarecrow, but yet, in the dim firelight, the grisly face under that horrid wig seemed to leer intelligently, to watch him with secret malice out of its shadowy eye sockets, until he looked away with clammy skin and a shiver of half-superstitious terror. But this would never do. The evening had run out, consumed by these engrossing labours, it was nearly eleven o'clock, and high time for him to be gone. For if the brattles should return prematurely he was lost. Pulling himself together with an effort, he struck a match and lit the little candles one after the other. In a quarter of an hour or so, they would have burned down to the balls of string, and then he walked quickly out of the room, but, at the door, he paused for a moment to look back at the ghastly figure, seated rigidly in the chair with the lighted candles at its feet, like some foul fiend appeased by votive fires. The unsteady flames threw flickering shadows on its face that made it seem to mow and gibber and grin in mockery of all his care and caution. So he turned and tremblingly ran down the stairs opening the staircase window as he went. Running into the shop, he lit the candles there and ran out again, shutting the door after him. Secretly and guiltily he crept down the hall, and opening the door a few inches peered out. A blast of icy wind poured in with a light powdering of dry snow. He opened his umbrella, flung open the door, looked up and down the empty street, stepped out, closed the door softly and strode away over the whitening pavement. Chapter 2, related by Christopher Jervis, M.D. It was one of the axioms of medico-legal practice laid down by my colleague, John Thorndike, that the investigator should be constantly on his guard against the effect of suggestion. Not only must all prejudices and preconceptions be avoided, but when information is received from outside, the actual, undeniable facts must be carefully sifted from the inferences which usually accompany them. Of the necessity for this precaution our insurance practice furnished an excellent instance in the case of the fire at Mr. Brattle's oil shop. The case was brought to our notice by Mr. Stalker of the Griffin Fire and Life Insurance Society a few days after Christmas. He dropped in, ostensibly to wish us a happy new year but a discreet pause in the conversation on Thorndyke's part elicited a further purpose. Did you see the account of that fire in Bloomsbury? Mr. Stalker asked, the oil shop? Yes. But I didn't note any details, excepting that a man was apparently burnt to death and that the affair happened on the 25th of December. Yes, I know, said Mr. Stalker. It seems uncharitable, but one can't help looking a little askance at these quarter-day fires. And the date isn't the only doubtful feature in this one, the divisional officer of the fire brigade, who has looked over the ruins, tells me that there are some appearances suggesting that the fire broke out in two different places the shop and the first floor room over it. Mind you, he doesn't say that it actually did. The place is so thoroughly gutted that very little is to be learned from it, but that is his impression, and it occurred to me that if you were to take a look at the ruins, your radiographic eye might detect something that he had overlooked. It isn't very likely, said Thorndyke. Every man to his trade. The divisional officer looks at a burnt house with an expert eye, which I do not. My evidence would not carry much weight if you were contesting the claim. Perhaps not, replied Mr. Stalker, and we are not anxious to contest the claim unless there is manifest fraud. Arson is a serious matter, it is willful murder in this case, remarked Thorndyke. I know, said Stalker. And that reminds me that the man who was burnt happens to have been insured in our office, too. So we stand a double loss, how much? asked Thorndyke, the dead man, Percival Bland, had insured his life for three thousand pounds, Thorndyke became thoughtful. The last statement had apparently made more impression on him than the former ones, if you want me to look into the case for you, said he, you had better let me have all the papers connected with it, including the proposal forms, Mr. Stalker smiled. I thought you would say that I know you of old, you see so I slipped the papers in my pocket before coming here, he laid the documents on the table and asked. Is there anything that you want to know about the case? Yes, replied Thorndyke. I want to know all that you can tell me, which is mighty little, said Stalker, but such as it is, you shall have it. The oil shop man's name is Brattle and the dead man, Bland, was his lodger. Bland appears to have been a perfectly steady, sober man in general, 
but it seems that he had announced his intention of spending a jovial Christmas night and giving himself a little extra indulgence. He was last seen by Mrs. Brattle at about half past six, sitting by a blazing fire, with a couple of unopened bottles of port on the table and a box of cigars. He had a book in his hand and two or three newspapers lay on the floor by his chair. Shortly after this, Mr. and Mrs. Brattle went out on a visit to Hornsey, leaving him alone in the house. Was there no servant? asked Thorndyke. The servant had the day and night off duty to go to her mother's. That, by the way, looks a trifle fishy. However, to return to the Brattles, they spent the evening at Hornsey and did not get home until past three in the morning, by which time their house was a heap of smoking ruins. Mrs. Brattle's idea is that Bland must have drunk himself sleepy, and dropped one of the newspapers into the fender, where a chance cinder may have started the blaze. Which may or may not be the true explanation. Of course, an habitually sober man can get pretty mimsy on two bottles of port. What time did the fire break out? asked Thorndyke. It was noticed about half past eleven that flames were issuing from one of the chimneys, and the alarm was given at once. The first engine arrived ten minutes later, but, by that time, the place was roaring like a furnace. Then the water plugs were found to be frozen hard, which caused some delay. In fact, before the engines were able to get to work the roof had fallen in, and the place was a mere shell. You know what an oil shop is, when once it gets a fair start. And Mr. Bland's body was found in the ruins, I suppose, body. Exclaimed Mr. Stalker, there wasn't much body. Just a few charred bones, which they dug out of the ashes next day. And the question of identity, we shall leave that to the coroner. But there really isn't any question. To begin with, there was no one else in the house, and then the remains were found mixed up with the springs and casters of the chair that Bland was sitting in when he was last seen. Moreover, there were found, with the bones, a pocket knife, a bunch of keys and a set of steel waistcoat buttons, all identified by Mrs. Brattle as belonging to Bland. She noticed the cut steel buttons on his waistcoat when she wished him good night. By the way, said Thorndyke, was Bland reading by the light of an oil lamp? No, replied Stalker. There was a two-branch gasolier with a porcelain shade to one burner, and he had that burner alight when Mrs. Brattle left. Thorndyke reflectively picked up the proposal form and, having glanced through it, remarked, I see that Bland is described as unmarried. Do you know why he insured his life for this large amount? No, we assumed that it was probably in connection with some loan that he had raised. I learn from the solicitor who notified us of the death, that the whole of Bland's property is left to a cousin named Mr. Lindsay, I think. So the probability is that this cousin had lent him money. But it is not the life claim that is interesting us. We must pay that in any case. It is the fire claim that we want you to look into. Very well, said Thorndyke. I will go round presently and look over the ruins, and see if I can detect any substantial evidence of fraud. If you would, said Mr. Stalker, rising to take his departures we should be very much obliged. Not that we shall probably contest the claim in any case. When he had gone, my colleague and I glanced through the papers, and I ventured to remark, it seems to me that Stalker doesn't quite appreciate the possibilities of this case. No, Thorndyke agreed. But, of course, it is an insurance company's business to pay, and not to boggle at anything short of glaring fraud. And we specialists too, he added with a smile, must beware of seeing too much. I suppose that, to a rhinologist, there is hardly such a thing as a healthy nose unless it is his own and the uric acid specialist is very apartment to find the firmament studded with dumbbell crystals. We mustn't forget that normal cases do exist, after all, that is true, said I, but, on the other hand, the rhinologist's business is with the unhealthy nose, and our concern is with abnormal cases, Thorndyke laughed. A Daniel come to judgment, said he. But my learned friend is quite right. Our function is to pick holes. So let us pocket the documents and wend Bloomsbury way. We can talk the case over as we go. We walked at an easy pace, for there was no hurry, and a little preliminary thought was useful. After a while, as Thorndyke made no remark, I reopened the subject. How does the case present itself to you? I asked. Much as it does to you, I expect, he replied. The circumstances invite inquiry, and I do not find myself connecting them with the shopkeeper. It is true that the fire occurred on quarter day, but there is nothing to show that the insurance will do more than cover the loss of stock, chattels and the profits of trade. The other circumstances are much more suggestive. Here is a house burned down and a man killed. That man was insured for three thousand pounds and, consequently, some person stands to gain by his death to that amount. 
The whole set of circumstances is highly favorable to the idea of homicide. The man was alone in the house when he died, and the total destruction of both the body and its surroundings seems to render investigation impossible. The cause of death can only be inferred, it cannot be proved, and the most glaring evidence of a crime will have vanished utterly. I think that there is a quite strong prima facie suggestion of murder. Under the known conditions, the perpetration of a murder would have been easy, it would have been safe from detection, and there is an adequate motive. On the other hand, suicide is not impossible. The man might have set fire to the house and then killed himself by poison or otherwise. But it is intrinsically less probable that a man should kill himself for another person's benefit than that he should kill another man for his own benefit. Finally, there is the possibility that the fire and the man's death were the result of accident, against which is the official opinion that the fire started in two places. If this opinion is correct, it establishes, in my opinion, a strong presumption of murder against some person who may have obtained access to the house. This point in the discussion brought us to the ruined house, which stood at the corner of two small streets. One of the firemen in charge admitted us, when we had shown our credentials, through a temporary door and down a ladder into the basement, where we found a number of men treading gingerly, ankle deep in white ash, among a litter of charred woodwork, fused glass, warped and broken china, and more or less recognizable metal objects. The coroner and the jury, the fireman explained, come to view the scene of the disaster. He introduced us to the former, who bowed stiffly and continued his investigations. These, said the other fireman, are the springs of the chair that the deceased was sitting in. We found the body or rather the bones lying among them under a heap of hot ashes, and we found the buttons of his clothes and the things from his pockets among the ashes, too. You'll see them in the mortuary with the remains. It must have been a terrific blaze, one of the jurymen remarked. Just look at this, sir, and he handed to Thorndyke what looked like part of a gas fitting, of which the greater part was melted into shapeless lumps and the remainder encrusted into fused porcelain. That, said the fireman, was the gasolier of the first floor room, where Mr. Bland was sitting. Ah! You won't turn that tap, sir, nobody'll ever turn that tap again. Thorndyke held the twisted mass of brass towards me in silence, and, glancing up the blackened walls, remarked, I think we shall have to come here again with the divisional officer, but meanwhile, we had better see the remains of the body. It is just possible that we may learn something from them. He applied to the coroner for the necessary authority to make the inspection, and, having obtained a rather ungracious and grudging permission to examine the remains when the jury had viewed them, began to ascend the ladder. Our friend would have liked to refuse permission, he remarked when we had emerged into the street, but he knew that I could and should have insisted, so I gathered from his manner, said I. But what is he doing here? This isn't his district, no, he is acting for Bettersford, who is laid up just now and a very poor substitute he is. A non-medical coroner is an absurdity in any case, and a coroner who is hostile to the medical profession is a public scandal. By the way, that gas tap offers a curious problem. You noticed that it was turned off? Yes, and consequently that the deceased was sitting in the dark when the fire broke out. I don't see the bearing of the fact, but it is certainly rather odd. Here is the mortuary. We had better wait and let the jury go in first. We had not long to wait. In a couple of minutes or so the twelve good men and true made their appearance with a small attendant crowd of ragamuffins. We let them enter first, and then we followed. The mortuary was a good-sized room, well lighted by a glass roof, and having at its center a long table on which lay the shell containing the remains. There was also a sheet of paper on which had been laid out a set of black and steel waistcoat buttons, a bunch of keys, a steel-handled pocket knife, a steel-cased watch on a partly fused rolled gold chain, and a pocket corkscrew. The coroner drew the attention of the jury to these objects, and then took possession of them, that they might be identified by witnesses. And meanwhile the jurymen gathered round the shell and stared shudderingly at its gruesome contents. I am sorry, gentlemen, said the coroner, to have to subject you to this painful ordeal. But duty is duty. We must hope, as I think we may, that this poor creature met a painless if in some respects a rather terrible death. At this point, Thorndyke, who had drawn near to the table cast a long and steady glance down into the shell, and immediately his ordinarily rather impassive face seemed to congeal, all expression faded from it, leaving it as immovable and uncommunicative as the granite face of an Egyptian statue. I knew the symptom of old and began to speculate on its present significance, are you taking any medical evidence? He asked, medical evidence? The coroner repeated, scornfully. Certainly not, sir. I do not waste the public money by employing so-called experts to tell the jury what each of them can see quite plainly for himself. I imagine. 
he added, turning to the foreman, that you will not require a learned doctor to explain to you how that poor fellow mortal met his death, and the foreman, glancing askance at the skull, replied, with a pallid and sickly smile, that he thought not. Do you, sir, the coroner continued, with a dramatic wave of the hand towards the plain coffin, suppose that we shall find any difficulty in determining how that man came by his death, I imagine, replied Thorndyke, without moving a muscle, or, indeed, appearing to have any muscles to move, I imagine you will find no difficulty whatever, so do I, said the coroner, then, retorted Thorndyke, with a faint, inscrutable smile, we are, for once, in complete agreement, as the coroner and jury retired, leaving my colleague and me alone in the mortuary, Thorndyke remarked, I suppose this kind of farce will be repeated periodically so long as these highly technical medical inquiries continued to be conducted by lay persons, I made no reply, for I had taken a long look into the shell, and was lost in astonishment. But my dear Thorndyke, I exclaimed, what on earth does it mean? Are we to suppose that a woman can have palmed herself off as a man on the examining medical officer of a London Life Assurance Society? Thorndyke shook his head. I think not, said he. Our friend, Mr. Bland, may conceivably have been a woman in disguise, but he certainly was not a negress, a negress. I gasped. By Jove! So it is. I hadn't looked at the skull. But that only makes the mystery more mysterious. Because, you remember, the body was certainly dressed in Bland's clothes. Yes, there seems to be no doubt about that. And you may have noticed, as I did, Thorndyke continued dryly, the remarkably fireproof character of the waistcoat buttons, watch case, knife handle, and other identifiable objects. But what a horrible affair! I exclaimed. The brute must have gone out and enticed some poor devil of a negress into the house, have murdered her in cold blood and then deliberately dressed the corpse in his own clothes. It is perfectly frightful. Again Thorndyke shook his head. It wasn't as bad as that, Jervis, said he, though I must confess that I feel strongly tempted to let your hypothesis stand. It would be quite amusing to put Mr. Bland on trial for the murder of an unknown negress, and let him explain the facts himself. But our reputation is at stake. Look at the bones again and a little more critically. You very probably looked for the sex first, then you looked for racial characters. Now carry your investigations a step farther. There is the stature, said I but that is of no importance, as these are not Bland's bones. The only other point that I notice is that the fire seems to have acted very unequally on the different parts of the body. Yes, agreed Thorndyke, and that is the point. Some parts are more burned than others, and the parts which are burned most are the wrong parts. Look at the backbone, for instance. The vertebrae are as white as chalk. They are mere masses of bone ash. But, of all parts of the skeleton, there is none so completely protected from fire as the backbone with the great dorsal muscles behind, and the whole mass of the viscera in front. Then look at the skull. Its appearance is quite inconsistent with the suggested facts. The bones of the face are bare and calcined and the orbits contain not a trace of the eyes or other structures, and yet there is a charred mass of what may or may not be scalp adhering to the crown. But the scalp, as the most exposed and the thinnest covering, would be the first to be destroyed, while the last to be consumed would be the structures about the jaws and the base, of which, you see, not a vestige is left, here he lifted the skull carefully from the shell, and, peering in through the great vermin at the base, handed it to me, look in, he said, through the vermin magnum you will see better if you hold the orbits towards the skylight and notice an even more extreme inconsistency with the supposed conditions. The brain and membranes have vanished without leaving a trace. The inside of the skull is as clean as if it had been macerated. But this is impossible. The brain is not only protected from the fire, it is also protected from contact with the air. But without access of oxygen, although it might become carbonized, it could not be consumed. No, Jervis, it won't do. I replaced the skull in the coffin and looked at him in surprise. What is it that you are suggesting? I asked, I suggest that this was not a body at all, but merely a dry skeleton. But, I objected, what about those masses of what looks like charred muscle adhering to the bones? Yes, he replied, I have been noticing them. They do, as you say, look like masses of charred muscle. But they are quite shapeless and structureless, I cannot identify a single muscle or muscular group, and there is not a vestige of any of the tendons. Moreover, the distribution is false. For instance, will you tell me what muscle you think that is? He pointed to a thick, charred mass on the inner surface of the left tibia or shin bone. Now this portion of the bone as many a hockey player has had reason to realize has no muscular covering at all. 
It lies immediately under the skin. I think you are right, Thorndyke, said I. That lump of muscle in the wrong place gives the whole fraud away. But it was really a rather smart dodge. This fellow Bland must be an ingenious rascal. Yes, agreed Thorndyke, but an unscrupulous villain too. He might have burned down half the street and killed a score of people. He'll have to pay the piper for this little frolic, what shall you do now? Are you going to notify the coroner? No, that is not my business. I think we will verify our conclusions and then inform our clients and the police. We must measure the skull as well as we can without calipers, but it is, fortunately, quite typical. The short, broad, flat nasal bones, with the simian groove, and those large, strong teeth worn flat by hard and gritty food, are highly characteristic. He once more lifted out the skull, and, with a spring tape, made a few measurements, while I noted the lengths of the principal long bones and the width across the hips. I make the cranial nasal index 55 said he, as he replaced the skull, and the cranial index about 72, which are quite representative numbers, and, as I see that your notes show the usual disproportionate length of arm and the characteristic curve of the tibia, we may be satisfied. But it is fortunate that the specimen is so typical. To the experienced eye, racial types have a physiognomy which is unmistakable on mere inspection. But you cannot transfer the experienced eye. You can only express personal conviction and back it up with measurements, and now we will go and look in on Stalker, and inform him that his office has saved three thousand pounds by employing us. After which it will be Westward Ho, for Scotland Yard, to prepare an unpleasant little surprise for Mr. Percival Bland. There was joy among the journalists on the following day. Each of the morning papers devoted an entire column to an unusually detailed account of the inquest on the late Percival Bland who, it appeared, met his death by misadventure and a verbatim report of the coroner's eloquent remarks on the danger of solitary, fireside dippling, and the stupefying effects of port wine. An adjacent column contained an equally detailed account of the appearance of the deceased at Bow Street Police Court to answer complicated charges of arson, fraud and forgery while a third collated the two accounts with gleeful commentaries, Mr. Percival Bland, alias Robert Lindsay, now resides on the breezy uplands of Dartmoor, where, in his abundant leisure, he, no doubt, regrets his misdirected ingenuity. But he has not labored in vain. To the Lord Chancellor he has furnished an admirable illustration of the danger of appointing late coroners, and to me an unforgettable warning against the effects of suggestion. Part 2, The Missing Mortgagee, Chapter 1 Thomas Selton Early in the afternoon of a warm, humid November day, Thomas Selton sauntered dejectedly along the Margate Esplanade, casting an eye now on the slate-coloured sea with its pool of slate-coloured sky, and now on the harbour, where the ebb tide was just beginning to expose the mud. It was a dreary prospect, and Elton varied it by observing the few fishermen and fewer promenaders who walked foot to foot with their distorted reflections in the wet pavement, and thus it was that his eye fell on a smartly dressed man who had just stepped into a shelter to light a cigar. A contemporary joker has classified the Scotsmen who abound in South Africa into two groups, those, namely, who hail from Scotland, and those who hail from Palestine. Now, something in the aspect of the broad back that was presented to his view, in that of the curly, black hair and the exuberant raiment, suggested to Elton a Scotsman of the latter type. In fact, there was a suspicion of disagreeable familiarity in the figure which caused him to watch it and slacken his pace. The man backed out of the shelter diffusing as your clouds, and, drawing an envelope from his pocket, read something that was written on it. Then he turned quickly and so did Elton, but not quickly enough. For he was a solitary figure on that bald and empty expanse, and the other had seen him at the first glance. Elton walked away slowly, but he had not gone a dozen paces when he felt the anticipated slap on the shoulder and heard the too well-remembered voice, Blow me, if I don't believe you were trying to cut me, Tom, it said. Elton looked round with ill-assumed surprise. Hello, Gordon. Who the deuce would have thought of seeing you here? Gordon laughed thickly. Not you, apparently, and you don't look as pleased as you might now you have seen me. Whereas I'm delighted to see you, and especially to see that things are going so well with you. What do you mean? Asked Elton, taking your winter holiday by the sea, like a blooming duke. I'm not taking a holiday, said Elton. I was so worn out that I had to have some sort of change, but I've brought my work down with me and I put in a full seven hours every day, that's right, said Gordon. Consider the ant. Nothing like steady industry. I've brought my work down with me too, a little slip of paper with a stamp on it. You know the article, Tom, I know. But it isn't due till tomorrow, is it, isn't it, by gum? It's due this very day. 
the twentieth of the month. That's why I'm here. Knowing your little weakness in the matter of dates, and having a small item to collect in Canterbury, I thought I'd just come on, and save you the useless expense that results from forgetfulness. Elton understood the hint, and his face grew rigid. I can't do it, Gordon, one can't really. Haven't got it, and shan't have it until I'm paid for the batch of drawings that I'm working on now. Oh, but what a pity! exclaimed Gordon, taking the cigar from his thick, pouting lips to utter the exclamation. Here you are, bluing your capital on seaside jaunts and reducing your income at a stroke by a clear four pounds a year, how do you make that out? demanded Elton. Tut, tut, protested Gordon, what an unbusiness-like chap you are. Here's a little matter of twenty pounds quarters interest. If it's paid now, it's twenty. If it isn't, it goes on to the principal and there's another four pounds a year to be paid. Why don't you try to be more economical, dear boy? Elton looked askance at the vampire by his side, at the plump blue-shaven cheeks, the thick black eyebrows, the drooping nose, and the full, red lips that embraced the cigar, and though he was a mild-tempered man he felt that he could have battered that sensual, complacent face out of all human likeness, with something uncommonly like enjoyment. But of these thoughts nothing appeared in his reply, for a man cannot afford to say all he would wish to a creditor who could ruin him with a word. You mustn't be too hard on me, Gordon, said he. Give me a little time. I'm doing all I can, you know. I earn every penny that I am able, and I have kept my insurance paid up regularly. I shall be paid for this work in a week or two and then we can settle up. Gordon made no immediate reply, and the two men walked slowly eastward, a curiously ill-assorted bear, the one prosperous, jaunty, overdressed, the other pale and dejected, and, with his well-brushed but napless clothes, his patched boots and shiny brimmed hat, the very type of decent, struggling poverty, they had just passed the pier, and were coming to the base of the jetty, when Gordon next spoke, can't we get off this beastly wet pavement? he asked, looking down at his dainty and highly polished boots. What's it like down on the sands? Oh, it's very good walking, said Elton, between here and Fawness, and probably drier than the pavement, then, said Gordon, I vote we go down and accordingly they descended the sloping way beyond the jetty. The stretch of sand left by the retiring tide was as smooth and firm as a sheet of asphalt, and far more pleasant to walk upon. We seem to have the place all to ourselves, remarked Gordon, with the exception of some half-dozen dukes like yourself. As he spoke, he cast a cunning black eye furtively at the dejected man by his side, considering how much further squeezing was possible, and what would be the probable product of a further squeeze but he quickly averted his gaze as Elton turned on him a look eloquent of contempt and dislike. There was another pause, for Elton made no reply to the last observation, then Gordon changed over from one arm to the other the heavy fur overcoat that he was carrying. Needn't have brought this beastly thing, he remarked, if I'd known it was going to be so warm, shall I carry it for you a little away? Asked the naturally polite Elton, if you would, dear boy, replied Gordon. It's difficult to manage an overcoat, an umbrella and cigar all at once. He handed over the coat with a sigh of relief, and having straightened himself and expanded his chest, remarked, I suppose you're beginning to do quite well now, Dom? Elton shook his head gloomily. No, he answered, it's the same old grind. But surely they're beginning to recognize your talents by this time, said Gordon, with the persuasive air of a counsel. That's just the trouble, said Elton. You see, I haven't any, and they recognized the fact long ago. I'm just a journeyman and journeyman's work is what I get given to me. You mean to say that the editors don't appreciate talent when they see it? I don't know about that, said Elton, but they're most infernally appreciative of the lack of it. Gordon blew out a great cloud of smoke, and raised his eyebrows reflectively. Do you think, he said after a brief pause, you give them a fair chance? I've seen some of your stuff. It's blooming prim, you know. Why don't you try something more lively? More skittish, you know, old chap, something with legs, you know and high shoes. See what I mean, old chap? High with good full calves and not too fat in the ankle. That ought to fetch em, don't you think so? Elton scowled. You're thinking of the drawings in Hold Me Up, he said scornfully, but you're mistaken. Any fool can draw a champagne bottle upside down with a French shoe at the end of it, no doubt, dear boy, said Gordon, but I expect that sort of fool knows what pays, a good many fools seem to know that much, retorted Elton and then he was sorry he had spoken, for Gordon was not really an amiable man, and the expression of his face suggested that he had read a personal application into the rejoinder. So, once more, the two men walked on in silence. 
Presently their footsteps led them to the margin of the weed-covered rocks, and here, from under a high heap of bladder rack, a large green shore crab rushed out and menaced them with uplifted claws. Gordon stopped and stared at the creature with cockney surprise, prodding it with his umbrella, and speculating aloud as to whether it was good to eat. The crab, as if alarmed at the suggestion, suddenly darted away and began to scuttle over the green-clad rocks, finally plunging into a large, deep pool. Gordon pursued it, hobbling awkwardly over the slippery rocks, until he came to the edge of the pool, over which he stooped, raking inquisitively among the weedy fringe with his umbrella. He was so much interested in his quarry that he failed to allow for the slippery surface on which he stood. The result was disastrous. Of a sudden, one foot began to slide forward, and when he tried to recover his balance, was instantly followed by the other. For a moment he struggled frantically to regain his footing, executing a sort of splashing, stamping dance on the margin. Then, the circling sea birds were startled by a yell of terror, an ivory-handled umbrella flew across the rocks, and Mr. Solomon Gordon took a complete header into the deepest part of the pool. What the crab thought of it history does not relate. What Mr. Gordon thought of it is unsuitable for publication, but, as he rose, like an extremely up-to-date merman, he expressed his sentiments with a wealth of adjectives that brought Elton in the verge of hysteria. It's a good job you brought your overcoat, after all, Elton remarked for the sake of saying something, and thereby avoiding the risk of exploding into undeniable laughter. The Hebrew made no reply at least, no reply that lends itself to verbatim report but staggered towards the hospitable overcoat, holding out his dripping arms. Having inducted him into the garment and buttoned him up, Elton hurried off to recover the umbrella, and, incidentally, to indulge himself in a broad grin, and, having secured it, angled with it for the smart billycock which was floating across the pool. It was surprising what a change the last minute or two had wrought. The positions of the two men were now quite reversed. Despite his shabby clothing, Elton seemed to walk quite jauntily as compared with his shuddering companion who trotted by his side with short miserable steps, shrinking into the uttermost depths of his enveloping coat, like an alarmed winkle into its shell puffing out his cheeks and anathematizing the universe in general as well as his chattering teeth would let him, for some time they hurried along towards the slope by the jetty without exchanging any further remarks, then suddenly, Elton asked, what are you going to do, Gordon? You can't travel like that, can't you lend me a change? asked Gordon. Elton reflected. He had another suit, his best suit, which he had been careful to preserve in good condition for use on those occasions when a decent appearance was indispensable. He looked askance at the man by his side and something told him that the treasured suit could probably receive less careful treatment than it was accustomed to. Still the man couldn't be allowed to go about in wet clothes, I've got a spare suit, he said. It isn't quite up to your style, and may not be much of a fit, but I dare say you'll be able to put up with it for an hour or two, it'll be dry anyhow, mumbled Gordon, so we won't trouble about the style. How far is it to your rooms? The plural number was superfluous. Elton's room was in a little ancient flint house at the bottom of a narrow close in the old quarter of the town. You reached it without any formal preliminaries of bell or knocker by simply letting yourself in by a street door, crossing a tiny room, opening the door of what looked like a narrow cupboard, and squeezing up a diminutive flight of stairs, which was unexpectedly exposed to view. By following this procedure, the two men reached a small bed sitting room, that is to say, it was a bedroom, but by sitting down on the bed, you converted it into a sitting room. Gordon puffed out his cheeks and looked round distastefully. You might just ring for some hot water, old chappy, he said. Elton laughed aloud. Ring! he exclaimed. Ring what? Your clothes are the only things that are likely to get wrung. Well, then, sing out for the servant, said Gordon. Elton laughed again. My dear fellow, said he, we don't go in for servants. There is only my landlady and she never comes up here. She's too fat to get up the stairs, and besides, she's got a game leg. I look after my room myself. You'll be all right if you have a good rub down, Gordon groaned, and emerged reluctantly from the depths of his overcoat, while Elton brought forth from the chest of drawers the promised suit and the necessary undergarments. One of these latter Gordon held up with a sour smile, as he regarded it with extreme disfavor, I shouldn't think, said he, you need have been at the trouble of marking them so plainly. No one's likely to want to run away with them. The undergarments certainly contrasted very unfavorably with the delicate garments which he was peeling off, excepting in one respect. They were dry, and that had to console him for the ignominious change. The clothes fitted quite fairly, notwithstanding the difference between the figures of the two men, for while Gordon was a slender man grown fat, Elton was a broad man grown thin, which, 
in a way, averaged their superficial area. Elton watched the process of investment and noted the caution with which Gordon smuggled the various articles from his own pockets into those of the borrowed garments without exposing them to view, heard the jingle of money, saw the sumptuous gold watch and massive chain transplanted and noted with interest the large leather wallet that came forth from the breast pocket of the wet coat. He got a better view of this from the fact that Gordon himself examined it narrowly, and even opened it to inspect its contents. Lucky that wasn't an ordinary pocketbook. He remarked. If it had been, your receipt could have got wet, and so would one or two other little articles that wouldn't have been improved by salt water. And, talking of the receipt, Tom, shall I hand it over now? You can if you like, said Elton, but as I told you, I haven't got the money, on which Gordon muttered, pity, pity, and thrust the wallet into his, or rather, Elton's breast pocket. A few minutes later, the two men came out together into the gathering darkness, and as they walked slowly up the close, Elton asked, are you going up to town tonight, Gordon, how can I? Was the reply. I can't go without my clothes. No, I shall run over to Broadstairs. A client of mine keeps a boarding house there. He'll have to put me up for the night, and if you can get my clothes cleaned and dried I can come over for them tomorrow, these arrangements having been settled. The two men adjourned, at Gordon's suggestion, for tea at one of the restaurants on the front, and after that, again at Gordon's suggestion, they set forth together along the cliff path that leads to Broadstairs by way of Kingsgate. You may as well walk with me into Broadstairs, said Gordon, I'll stand you the fare back by rail, and to this Elton had agreed not because he was desirous of the other man's company, but because he still had some lingering hopes of being able to adjust the little difficulty respecting the instalment. He did not, however, open the subject at once. Profoundly as he loathed and despised the human spider whom necessity made his associate for the moment, he exerted himself to keep up a current of amusing conversation. It was not easy, for Gordon, like most men whose attention is focused on the mere requirement of money, looked with a dull eye on the ordinary interests of life. His tastes in art he had already hinted at, and his other tastes lay much in the same direction. Money first, for its own sake, and then those coarser and more primitive gratifications that it was capable of purchasing. This was the horizon that bounded Mr. Solomon Gordon's field of vision, nevertheless, they were well on their way before Elton alluded to the subject that was uppermost in both their minds. Look here, Gordon, he said at length, can't you manage to give me a bit more time to pay up this instalment? It doesn't seem quite fair to keep sending up the principal like this, well, dear boy, replied Gordon, it's your own fault, you know. If you would only bear the dates in mind, it wouldn't happen, but, pleaded Elton, just consider what I'm paying you. I originally borrowed fifty pounds from you, and I'm now paying you eighty pounds a year in addition to the insurance premium. That's close on a hundred a year, just about half that I managed to earn by slaving like a nigger. If you stick it up any farther you won't leave me enough to keep body and soul together, which really means that I shan't be able to pay you at all. There was a brief pause, then Gordon said dryly, you talk about not paying, dear boy, as if you had forgotten about that promissory note, Elton set his teeth. His temper was rising rapidly. But he restrained himself, I should have a pretty poor memory if I had, he replied, considering the number of reminders you've given me, you've needed them, Tom, said the other. I've never met a slacker man in keeping to his engagements, at this Elton lost his temper completely, that's a damned lie. He exclaimed, and you know it, you infernal, dirty, blood-sucking parasite, Gordon stopped dead, look here, my friend, said he, none of that. If I've any of your damned sauce, I'll give you a sound good hammering, the deuce you will, said Elton, whose fingers were itching, not for the first time, to take some recompense for all that he had suffered from the insatiable usurer. Nothing's preventing you now, you know, but I fancy scent. Percent. Is more in your line than fighting, give me any more sauce and you'll see, said Gordon. Very well, was the quiet rejoinder. I have great pleasure in informing you that you are a human more worm. How does that suit you, for reply, Gordon threw down his overcoat and umbrella on the grass at the side of the path, and deliberately slapped Elton on the cheek. The reply followed instantly in the form of a smart left-hander which took effect on the bridge of the Hebrews' rather prominent nose. Thus the battle was fairly started, and it proceeded with all the fury of accumulated hatred on the one side and sharp physical pain on the other. What little science there was appertained to Elton, in spite of which, however, he had to give way to his heavier, better nourished and more excitable opponent. Regardless of the punishment he received, the infuriated Jew rushed at him and, by sheer weight of onslaught, drove him backward across the little green, 
Suddenly, Elton, who knew the place by daylight, called out in alarm, Look out, Gordon. Get back, you fool, but Gordon, blind with fury, and taking this as attempt to escape, only pressed him harder. Elton's pugnacity died out instantly in mortal terror. He shouted out another warning and as Gordon still pressed him, battering furiously, he did the only thing that was possible, he dropped to the ground. And then, in the twinkling of an eye came the catastrophe. Borne forward by his own momentum, Gordon stumbled over Elton's prostrate body, staggered forward a few paces, and fell. Elton heard a muffled groan that faded quickly, and mingled with the sound of falling earth and stones. He sprang to his feet and looked round and saw that he was alone, for some moments he was dazed by the suddenness of the awful thing that had happened. He crept timorously towards the unseen edge of the cliff, and listened. There was no sound save the distant surge of the breakers, and the scream of an invisible seabird. It was useless to try to look over. Near as he was, he could not, even now, distinguish the edge of the cliff from the dark beach below. Suddenly he bethought him of a narrow cutting that led down from the cliff to the shore. Quickly crossing the green, and mechanically stooping to pick up Gordon's overcoat and umbrella, he made his way to the head of the cutting and ran down the rough chalk roadway. At the bottom he turned to the right and, striding hurriedly over the smooth sand, peered into the darkness at the foot of the cliff. Soon there loomed up against the murky sky the shadowy form of the little headland on which he and Gordon had stood, and, almost at the same moment, there grew out of the darkness of the beach a darker spot amidst a constellation of smaller spots of white. As he drew nearer the dark spot took shape, a horrid shape with sprawling limbs and a head strangely awry. He stepped forward, trembling and spoke the name that the thing had borne. He grasped the flabby hand, and laid his fingers on the wrist, but it only told him the same tale as did that strangely misplaced head. The body lay face downwards, and he had not the courage to turn it over, but that his enemy was dead he had not the faintest doubt. He stood up amidst the litter of fallen chalk and earth and looked down at the horrible, motionless thing, wondering numbly and vaguely what he should do. Should he go and seek assistance? The answer to that came in another question. How came that body to be lying on the beach? And what answer should he give to the inevitable questions? And swiftly there grew up in his mind, born of the horror of the thing that was, a yet greater horror of the thing that might be. A minute later, a panic-stricken man stole with stealthy swiftness up the narrow cutting and set forth towards Margate, stopping anon to listen, and stealing away off the path into the darkness, to enter the town by the inland road. Little sleep was there that night for Elton in his room in the old flint house. The dead man's clothes, which greeted him on his arrival, hanging limply on the towel horse where he had left them, haunted him through the night. In the darkness, the sour smell of damp cloth assailed him with an endless reminder of their presence, and after each brief doze, he would start up in alarm and hastily light his candle, only to throw its flickering light on those dank, drowned-looking vestments. His thoughts, half-controlled, as night thoughts are, flitted erratically from the unhappy past to the unstable present, and thence to the incalculable future. Once he lighted the candle specially to look at his watch to see if the tide had yet crept up to that solitary figure on the beach, nor could he rest again until the time of high water was well past. And all through these wanderings of his thoughts there came, recurring like a horrible refrain, the question what would happen when the body was found? Could he be connected with it and, if so, would he be charged with murder? At last he fell asleep and slumbered on until the landlady thumped at the staircase door to announce that she had brought his breakfast. As soon as he was dressed he went out. Not, however, until he had stuffed Gordon's still damp clothes and boots, the cumbrous overcoat and the smart billy cock hat into his trunk, and put the umbrella into the darkest corner of the cupboard. Not that anyone ever came up to the room, but that, already, he was possessed with the uneasy secretiveness of the criminal. He went straight down to the beach, with what purpose he could hardly have said, but an irresistible impulse drove him thither to see if it was there. He went down by the jetty and struck out eastward over the smooth sand, looking about him with dreadful expectation for some small crowd or hurrying messenger. From the foot of the cliffs, over the rocks to the distant line of breakers, his eye roved with eager dread, and still he hurried eastward, always drawing nearer to the place that he feared to look on. As he left the town behind, so he left behind the one or two idlers on the beach, and when he turned Faunus Point he lost sight of the last of them and went forward alone. It was less than half an hour later that the fatal headland opened out beyond whiteness. Not a soul had he met along that solitary beach, and though, once or twice, he had started at the sight of some mass of driftwood or heap of seaweed, the dreadful thing that he was seeking had not yet appeared. He passed the opening of the cutting and approached the headland, 
breathing fast and looking about him fearfully. Already he could see the larger lumps of chalk that had fallen, and looking up, he saw a clean, white patch at the summit of the cliff. But still there was no sign of the corpse. He walked on more slowly now, considering whether it could have drifted out to sea, or whether he should find it in the next bay. And then, rounding the headland, he came in sight of a black hole at the cliff foot, the entrance to a deep cave. He approached yet more slowly, sweeping his eye round the little bay, and looking apprehensively at the cavity before him. Suppose the thing should have washed in there. It was quite possible. Many things did wash into that cave, for he had once visited it and had been astonished at the quantity of seaweed and jetsam that had accumulated within it. But it was an uncomfortable thought. It would be doubly horrible to meet the awful thing in the dim twilight of the cavern. And yet, the black archway seemed to draw him on, step by step, until he stood at the portal and looked in. It was an eerie place, chilly and damp. The clammy walls and roof stained green and purple and black with encrusting lichens. At one time, Elton had been told, it used to be haunted by smugglers, and then communicated with an underground passage, and the old smugglers' lookout still remained, a narrow tunnel, high up the cliff, looking out into Kingsgate Bay, and even some vestiges of the rude steps that led up to the lookout platform could still be traced, and were not impossible to climb. Indeed, Elton had, at his last visit, climbed to the platform and looked out through the spy hole. He recalled the circumstance now, as he stood, peering nervously into the darkness, and straining his eyes to see what jetsam the ocean had brought since then. At first he could see nothing but the smooth sand near the opening, then, as his eyes grew more accustomed to the gloom, he could make out the great heap of seaweed on the floor of the cave. Insensibly, he crept in, with his eyes riveted on the weedy mass and, as he left the daylight behind him, so did the twilight of the cave grow clearer. His feet left the firm sand and trod the springy mass of weed, and in the silence of the cave he could now hear plainly the rain-like patter of the leaping sand hoppers. He stopped for a moment to listen to the unfamiliar sound, and still the gloom of the cave grew lighter to his more accustomed eyes, and then, in an instant, he saw it. From a heap of weed, a few paces ahead, projected a boot, his own boot, he recognized the patch on the sole, and at the sight, his heart seemed to stand still. Though he had somehow expected to find it here, its presence seemed to strike him with a greater shock of horror from that very circumstance. He was standing stock still, gazing with fearful fascination at the boot and the swelling mound of weed, when, suddenly, there struck upon his ear the voice of a woman, singing. He started violently. His first impulse was to run out of the cave. But a moment's reflection told him what madness this would be. And then the voice drew nearer, and there broke out the high, rippling laughter of a child. Elton looked in terror at the bright opening of the cavern's mouth, expecting every moment to see it frame a group of figures. If that happened, he was lost, for he would have been seen actually with the body. Suddenly he bethought him of the spy hole and the platform, both of which were invisible from the entrance, and turning, he ran quickly over the sodden weed till he came to the remains of the steps. Climbing hurriedly up these, he reached the platform, which was enclosed in a large niche, just as the reverberating sound of voices told him that the strangers were within the mouth of the cave. He strained his ears to catch what they were saying and to make out if they were entering farther. It was a child's voice that he had first heard, and very weird were the hollow echoes of the thin treble that were flung back from the rugged walls. But he could not hear what the child had said. The woman's voice, however, was quite distinct, and the words seemed significant in more senses than one. No, dear, it said, you had better not go in. It's cold and damp come out into the sunshine, Elton breathed more freely. But the woman was more right than she knew. It was cold and damp, that thing under the black tangle of weed. Better far to be out in the sunshine. He himself was already longing to escape from the chill and gloom, of the cavern. But he could not escape yet. Innocent as he actually was, his position was that of a murderer. He must wait until the coast was clear, and then steal out, to hurry away unobserved. He crept up cautiously to the short tunnel and peered out through the opening across the bay. And then his heart sank. Below him, on the sunny beach, a small party of visitors had established themselves just within view of the mouth of the cave, and even as he looked, a man approached from the wooden stairway down the cliff, carrying a couple of deck chairs. So, for the present his escape was hopelessly cut off. He went back to the platform and sat down to wait for his release, and, as he sat, his thoughts went back once more to the thing that lay under the weed. How long would it lie there undiscovered? And what would happen when it was found? What was there to connect him with it? Of course, there was his name on the clothing. But there was nothing incriminating in that, 
if he had only had the courage to give information at once. But it was too late to think of that now. Besides, it suddenly flashed upon him, there was the receipt in the wallet. That receipt mentioned him by name and referred to a loan. Obviously, its suggestion was most sinister, coupled with his silence. It was a deadly item of evidence against him. But no sooner had he realized the appalling significance of this document than he also realized that it was still within his reach. Why should he leave it there to be brought in evidence in false evidence, to against him? Slowly he rose and, creeping down the tunnel, once more looked out. The people were sitting quietly in their chairs, the man was reading, and the child was digging in the sand. Elton looked across the bay to make sure that no other person was approaching, and then, hastily climbing down the steps, walked across the great bed of weed, driving an army of sand hoppers before him. He shuddered at the thought of what he was going to do, and the clammy chill of the cave seemed to settle on him in a cold sweat. He came to the little mound from which the boot projected, and began, shudderingly and with faltering hand, to lift the slimy, tangled weed. As he drew aside the first bunch, B gave a gasp of horror and quickly replaced it. The body was lying on its back, and, as he lifted the weed he had uncovered not the face, for the thing had no face. It had struck either the cliff or a stone upon the beach and but there is no need to go into particulars, it had no face. When he had recovered a little, Elton groped shudderingly among the weed until he found the breast pocket from which he quickly drew out the wallet, now clammy, sodden and loathsome. He was rising with it in his hand when an apparition, seen through the opening of the cave, arrested his movement as if he had been suddenly turned into stone. A man, apparently a fisherman or sailor, was sauntering past some thirty yards from the mouth of the cave, and at his heels trotted a mongrel dog. The dog stopped, and, lifting his nose, seemed to sniff the air, and then he began to walk slowly and suspiciously towards the cave. The man sauntered on and soon passed out of view, but the dog still came on towards the cave, stopping now and again with upraised nose. The catastrophe seemed inevitable. But just at that moment the man's voice rose, loud and angry, evidently calling the dog. The animal hesitated, looking wistfully from his master to the cave, but when the summons was repeated, he turned reluctantly and trotted away. Elton stood up and took a deep breath. The chilly sweat was running clown his face, his heart was thumping and his knees trembled, so that he could hardly get back to the platform. What hideous peril had he escaped and how narrowly? For there he had stood, and had the man entered, he would have been caught in the very act of stealing the incriminating document from the body. For that matter, he was little better off now, with the dead man's property on his person, and he resolved instantly to take out and destroy the receipt and put back the wallet. But this was easier thought of than done. The receipt was soaked with sea water, and refused utterly to light when he applied a much to it. In the end, he tore it up into little fragments and deliberately swallowed them, one by one, but to restore the wallet was more than he was equal to just now. He would wait until the people had gone home to lunch, and then he would thrust it under the weed as he ran past. So he sat down again and once more took up the endless thread of his thoughts. The receipt was gone now, and with it the immediate suggestion of motive. There remained only the clothes with their two legible markings. They certainly connected him with the body, but they offered no proof of his presence at the catastrophe. And then, suddenly, another most startling idea occurred to him. Who could identify the body the body that had no face? There was the wallet, it was true, but he could take that away with him, and there was a ring on the finger and some articles in the pockets which might be identified. But a voice seemed to whisper to him these things were removable, too. And if he removed them, what then? Why, then, the body was that of Thomas Selton, a friendless, poverty-stricken artist, about whom no one would trouble to ask any questions, he pondered on this new situation profoundly. It offered him a choice of alternatives. Either he might choose the imminent risk of being hanged for a murder that he had not committed, or he might surrender his identity forever and move away to a new environment. He smiled faintly. His identity. What might that be worth to barter against his life? Only yesterday he would gladly have surrendered it as the bare price of emancipation from the vampire who had fastened on to him. He thrust the wallet into his pocket and buttoned his coat. Thomas Elton was dead, and that other man, as yet unnamed, should go forth, as the woman had said, into the sunshine, chapter 2, related by Christopher Jervis, M.D., from various causes. The insurance business that passed through Thorndyke's hands had, of late, considerably increased. The number of societies which regularly employed him had grown larger, and, since the remarkable case of Percival Bland, the Griffin had made it a routine practice to send all inquest cases to us for report. It was in reference to one of these latter that Mr. Stalker, a senior member of the staff of that office, 
called on us one afternoon in December, and when he had laid his bag on the table and settled himself comfortably before the fire, he opened the business without preamble. I've brought you another inquest case, said he, a rather queer one, quite interesting from your point of view. As far as we can see, it is no particular interest for us excepting that it does rather look as if our examining medical officer had been a little casual. What is the special interest of the case from our point of view? Asked Thorndyke. I'll just give you a sketch of it, said Stalker, and I think you will agree that it's a case after your own heart. On the 24th of last month, some men who were collecting seaweed, to use as manure, discovered in a cave at Kingsgate, in the Isle of Thainet, the body of a man, lying under a mass of accumulated weed. As the tide was rising, they put the body into their cart and conveyed it to Margate, where, of course, an inquest was held, and the following facts were elicited. The body was that of a man named Thomas Elton. It was identified by the name marks on the clothing, by the visiting cards and a couple of letters which were found in the pockets. From the address on the letters it was seen that Elton had been staying in Margate, and on inquiry at that address, it was learned from the old woman who let the lodgings, that he had been missing about four days. The landlady was taken to the mortuary, and at once identified the body as that of her lodger. It remained only to decide how the body came into the cave, and this did not seem to present much difficulty, for the neck had been broken by a tremendous blow, which had practically destroyed the face, and there were distinct evidences of a breaking away of a portion of the top of the cliff, only a few yards from the position of the cave. There was apparently no doubt that Elton had fallen sheer from the top of the overhanging cliff onto the beach. Now, one would suppose with the evidence of this fall of about a hundred and fifty feet, the smashed face and broken neck, there was not much room for doubt as to the cause of death. I think you will agree with me. Dr. Jervis, certainly, I replied, it must be admitted that a broken neck is a condition that tends to shorten life, quite so, agreed Stalker, but our friend, the local coroner, is a gentleman who takes nothing for granted a very Thomas Didemus, who apparently agrees with Dr. Thorndyke that if there is no post-mortem, there is no inquest. So he ordered a post-mortem, which would have appeared to me an absurdly unnecessary proceeding, and I think that even you will agree with me, Dr. Thorndyke. But Thorndyke shook his head, not at all, said he. It might, for instance, be much more easy to push a drugged or poisoned man over a cliff than to put over the same man in his normal state. The appearance of violent accident is an excellent mask for the less obvious forms of murder, that's perfectly true, said Stalker and I suppose that is what the coroner thought. At any rate, he had the post-mortem made, and the result was most curious, for it was found, on opening the body, that the deceased had suffered from a smallish thoracic aneurysm, which had burst. Now, as the aneurysm must obviously have burst during life, it leaves the cause of death so I understand uncertain, at any rate, the medical witness was unable to say whether the deceased fell over the cliff in consequence of the bursting of the aneurysm or burst the aneurysm in consequence of falling over the cliff. Of course, it doesn't matter to us which way the thing happened, the only question which interests us is, whether a comparatively recently insured man ought to have had an aneurysm at all. Have you paid the claim? Asked Thorndyke. No, certainly not. We never pay a claim until we have had your report. But, as a matter of fact, there is another circumstance that is causing delay. It seems that Elton had mortgaged his policy to a money lender, named Gordon, and it is by him that the claim has been made, or rather, by a clerk of his, named Hyams. Now, we have had a good many dealings with this man Gordon, and hitherto B has always acted in person, and as he is a somewhat slippery gentleman we have thought it desirable to have the claim actually signed by him. And that is the difficulty. For it seems that Mr. Gordon is abroad and his whereabouts unknown to Hyams, so, as we certainly couldn't take Hyams's receipt for payment, the matter is in abeyance until Hyams can communicate with his principal. And now, I must be running away. I have brought you, as you will see, all the papers, including the policy and the mortgage deed. As soon as he was gone, Thorndyke gathered up the bundle of papers and sorted them out in what we apparently considered the order of their importance. First we glanced quickly through the proposal form and then took up the copy of the coroner's depositions. The medical evidence, be remarked, is very full and complete. Both the coroner and the doctor seemed to know their business, seeing that the man apparently fell over a cliff, said I, the medical evidence would not seem to be of first importance. It would seem to be more to the point to ascertain how he came to fall over, that's quite true, replied Thorndyke, and yet, this report contains some rather curious matter. The deceased had an aneurysm of the arch, that was probably rather recent. But he also had some slight 
old standing aortic disease, with full compensatory hypertrophy. He also had a nearly complete set of false teeth. Now, doesn't it strike you, Jervis, as rather odd that a man who was passed only five years ago as a first-class life, should, in that short interval, have become actually uninsurable? Yes, it certainly does look, said I, as if the fellow had had rather bad luck. What does the proposal form say? I took the document up and ran my eyes over it. On Thorndike's advice, medical examiners for the Griffin were instructed to make a somewhat fuller report than is usual in some companies. In this case, the ordinary answers to questions set forth that the heart was perfectly healthy and the teeth rather exceptionally good, and then, in the summary at the end, the examiner remarked, the proposer seems to be a completely sound and healthy man, he presents no physical defects whatever, with the exception of a bony ankylosis of the first joint of the third finger of the left hand, which he states to have been due to an injury, Thorndike looked up quickly. Which finger, did you say? He asked. The third finger of the left hand, I replied. Thorndike looked thoughtfully at the paper that he was reading. It's very singular, said he, for I see that the Margate doctor states that the deceased wore a signet ring on the third finger of the left hand. Now, of course, you couldn't get a ring onto a finger with bony ankylosis of a joint. He must have mistaken the finger, said I, or else the insurance examiner did. That is quite possible, Thorndike replied, but, doesn't it strike you as very singular that, whereas the insurance examiner mentions the ankylosis, which was of no importance from an insurance point of view. The very careful man who made the post-mortem should not have mentioned it, though, owing to the unrecognizable condition of the face, it was of vital importance for the purpose of identification. I admitted that it was very singular indeed, and we then resumed our study of the respective papers. But presently I noticed that Thorndike had laid the report upon his knee, and was gazing speculatively into the fire. I gather, said I, that my learned friend finds some matter of interest in this case, for reply. He handed me the bundle of papers, recommending me to look through them. Thank you, said I, rejecting them firmly, but I think I can trust you to have picked out all the plums. Thorndike smiled indulgently. They're not plums, Jervis, said he. They're only currants, but they make quite a substantial little heap. I disposed myself in a receptive attitude, somewhat after the fashion of the juvenile pelican, and he continued, if we take the small and unimpressive items and add them together, you will see that a quite considerable sum of discrepancy results. Thus, in 1903, Thomas Elton, aged 31, had a set of sound teeth. In 1908, at the age of 36, he was more than half toothless. Again, at the age of 31, his heart was perfectly healthy. At the age of 36, he had old aortic disease, with fully established compensation, and an aneurysm that was possibly due to it. When he was examined he had a noticeable incurable malformation. No such malformation is mentioned in connection with the body. He appears to have fallen over a cliff, and he had also burst an aneurysm. Now, the bursting of the aneurysm must obviously have occurred during life, but it would occasion practically instantaneous death. Therefore, if the fall was accidental, the rupture must have occurred either as he stood at the edge of the cliff, as he was in the act of falling, or on striking the beach, at the place where he apparently fell. The footpath is some thirty yards distant from the edge of the cliff. It is not known how he came to that spot, or whether he was alone at the time. Someone is claiming five hundred pounds as the immediate result of his death. There, you see, Jervis, are seven propositions, none of them extremely striking, but rather suggestive when taken together. You seem, said I, to suggest a doubt as to the identity of the body. I do, he replied. The identity was not clearly established. You don't think the clothing and the visiting cards conclusive. They're not parts of the body, he replied. Of course, substitution is highly improbable. But it is not impossible and the old woman I suggested, but he interrupted me, my dear Jervis, he exclaimed, I'm surprised at you. How many times has it happened within our knowledge that women have identified the bodies of total strangers as those of their husbands, fathers or brothers? The thing happens almost every year. As to this old woman, she saw a body with an unrecognizable face, dressed in the clothes of her missing lodger. Of course, it was the clothes that she identified, I suppose it was, I agreed, and then I said, you seem to suggest the possibility of foul play. Well, he replied, if you consider those seven points, you will agree with me that they present a cumulative discrepancy which it is impossible to ignore. The whole significance of the case turns on the question of identity. For, if this was not the body of Thomas Selton, it would appear to have been deliberately prepared to counterfeit that body. 
and such deliberate preparation would manifestly imply an attempt to conceal the identity of some other body. Then, he continued, after a pause, there is this deed. It looks quite regular and is correctly stamped, but it seems to me that the surface of the paper is slightly altered in one or two places and if one holds the document up to the light, the paper looks a little more transparent in those places. He examined the document for a few seconds with his pocket lens, and then passing lens and document to me, said, have a look at it, Jervis, and tell me what you think. I scrutinized the paper closely, taking it over to the window to get a better light, and to me, also, the paper appeared to be changed in certain places. Are we agreed as to the position of the altered places? Thorndike asked when I announced the fact, I only see three batches, I answered. Two correspond to the name, Thomas Selton and the third to one of the figures in the policy number, exactly, said Thorndike, and the significance is obvious. If the paper has really been altered, it means that some other name has been erased and Delton's substituted, by which arrangement, of course, the correctly dated stamp would be secured. And this the alteration of an old document is the only form of forgery that is possible with a dated, impressed stamp. Wouldn't it be rather a stroke of luck, I asked for a forger to happen to have in his possession a document needing only these two alterations? I see nothing remarkable in it, Thorndike replied. A money lender would have a number of documents of this kind in hand, and you observe that B was not bound down to any particular date. Any date within a year or so of the issue of the policy would answer his purpose. This document is, in fact, dated, as you see, about six months after the issue of the policy, I suppose, said I, that you will draw Stalker's attention to this matter. He will have to be informed, of course, Thorndike replied, but I think it would be interesting in the first place to call on Mr. Hyams. You will have noticed that there are some rather mysterious features in this case, and Mr. Hyams's conduct, especially if this document should turn out to be really a forgery, suggests that he may have some special information on the subject. He glanced at his watch and, after a few moments' reflection, added, I don't see why we shouldn't make our little ceremonial call at once. But it will be a delicate business, for we have mighty little to go upon. Are you coming with me? If I had had any doubts, Thorndike's last remark disposed of them, for the interview promised to be quite a sporting event. Mr. Hyams was presumably not quite newly hatched, and Thorndike, who utterly despised bluff of any kind, and whose exact mind refused either to act or speak one hair's breadth beyond his knowledge, was admittedly in somewhat of a fog. The meeting promised to be really entertaining. Mr. Hyams was discovered as the playwrights have it, in a small office at the top of a high building in Queen Victoria Street. He was a small gentleman, of sallow and greasy aspect, with heavy eyebrows and a still heavier nose. Are you Mr. Gordon? Thorndike suavely inquired as we entered. Mr. Hyams seemed to experience a momentary doubt on the subject, but finally decided that he was not. But perhaps, he added brightly, I can do your business for you as well. I dare say you can, Thorndike agreed significantly on which we were conducted into an inner den, where I noticed Thorndike's eye rest for an instant on a large iron safe. Now, said Mr. Hyams, shutting the door ostentatiously, what can I do for you? I want you, Thorndike replied, to answer one or two questions with reference to the claim made by you on the Griffin office in respect of Thomas Elton. Mr. Hyams's manner underwent a sudden change. He began rapidly to turn over papers, and opened and shut the drawers of his desk, with an air of restless preoccupation. Did the Griffin people send you here? He demanded brusquely. They did not specially instruct me to call on you, replied Thorndike. Then, said Hyams bouncing out of his chair, I can't let you occupy my time. I'm not here to answer conundrums from Torn, Dick or Harry, Thorndike rose from his chair. Then I am to understand, he said, with unruffled suavity, that you would prefer me to communicate with the directors, and leave them to take any necessary action. This gave Mr. Hyams pause. What action do you refer to? He asked. And, who are you? Thorndike produced a card and laid it on the table. Mr. Hyams had apparently seen the name before, for he suddenly grew rather pale and very serious. What is the nature of the questions that you wished to ask? He inquired. They refer to this claim, replied Thorndike. The first question is, where is Mr. Gordon? I don't know, said Hyams. Where do you think he is? Asked Thorndike. I don't think at all, replied Hyams turning a shade paler and looking everywhere but at Thorndike. Very well, said the latter, then the next question is, are you satisfied that this claim is really payable? I shouldn't have made it if I hadn't been, replied Hyams. Quite so, said Thorndike, and the third question is, 
Are you satisfied that the mortgage deed was executed as it purports to have been? I can't say anything about that, replied Hyams, who was growing every moment paler and more fidgety. It was done before my time. Thank you, said Thorndyke. You will, of course, understand why I am making these inquiries. I don't, said Hyams. Then, said Thorndyke, perhaps I had better explain. We are dealing, you observe, Mr. Hyams, with the case of a man who has met with a violent death under somewhat mysterious circumstances. We are dealing, also, with another man who has disappeared, leaving his affairs to take care of themselves, and with a claim, put forward by a third party, on behalf of the one man in respect of the other. When I say that the dead man has been imperfectly identified, and that the document supporting the claim presents certain peculiarities, you will see that the matter calls for further inquiry. There was an appreciable interval of silence. Mr. Hyams had turned a tallowy white, and looked furtively about the room, as if anxious to avoid the stony gaze that my colleague had fixed on him. Can you give us no assistance? Thorndyke inquired. At length, Mr. Hyams chewed a pen boulder ravenously, as he considered the question. At length, he burst out in an agitated voice, Look here, sir, if I tell you what I know, will you treat the information as confidential? I can't agree to that, Mr. Hyams, replied Thorndyke. It might amount to compounding a felony. But you will be wiser to tell me what you know. The document is a side issue, which my clients may never raise, and my own concern is with the death of this man. Hyams looked distinctly relieved. If that's so, said he, I'll tell you all I know, which is precious little, and which just amounts to this. Two days after Elton was killed, someone came to this office in my absence and opened the safe. I discovered the fact the next morning. Someone had been to the safe and rummaged over all the papers. It wasn't Gordon, because he knew where to find everything, and it wasn't an ordinary thief, because no cash or valuables had been taken. In fact, the only thing that I missed was a promissory note, drawn by Elton. You didn't miss a mortgage deed? Suggested Thorndyke, and Hyams, having snatched a little further refreshment from the penholder, said he did not, and the policy, suggested Thorndyke, was apparently not taken? No replied Hyams but it was looked for. Three bundles of policies had been untied, but this one happened to be in a drawer of my desk and I had the only key, and what do you infer from this visit? Thorndyke asked. Well, replied Hyams, the safe was opened with keys, and they were Gordon's keys or at any rate, they weren't mine and the person who opened it wasn't Gordon, and the things that were taken at least the thing, I mean chiefly concerned Elton. Naturally I smelt a rat, and when I read of the finding of the body, I smelt a fox. And have you formed any opinion about the body that was found? Yes, I have, he replied. My opinion is that it was Gordon's body, that Gordon had been putting the screw on Elton, and Elton had just pitched him over the cliff and gone down and changed clothes with the body. Of course, that's only my opinion. I may be wrong, but I don't think I am. As a matter of fact, Mr. Hyams was not wrong. An exhumation, consequent on Thorndyke's challenge of the identity of the deceased, showed that the body was that of Solomon Gordon. A hundred pounds reward was offered for information as to Elton's whereabouts. But no one ever earned it. A letter, bearing the postmark of Marseille, and addressed by the missing man to Thorndyke, gave a plausible account of Gordon's death, which was represented as having occurred accidentally at the moment when Gordon chanced to be wearing a suit of Elton's clothes. Of course, this account may have been correct, or again, it may have been false, but whether it was true or false, Elton, from that moment, vanished from Arken and has never since been heard of.